Hi everyone, it's me, Tim, and today I want to talk about loot tables, or my theory of loot tables. And I'll talk about what a loot table is, and then I'm going to talk about my theory and the, the literally hardcore design elements that go into deciding what items go on to loot tables. Um, I'm going to bring up a screenshot, examples of what I mean. This is kind of intended to be an extension of what I talked about in the game economy video, so you may want to watch that. This is, uh, I realized when I was talking about how I decide what items end up on what loot tables, I described it at a very high level. I kind of want to go into that in more detail. So first let's talk about what a loot table is. A loot table is a list of items that get put on a creature, either when it spawns or when it's killed. Um, I usually do it in my games when they spawn because you can often pickpocket them. A lot of games that don't have that just put it on the spawn. I mean, sorry, put it on the, when they're killed, they generate loot into their body, which gets converted into a container when it dies. There's a lot of ways of actually implementing a loot table. I'll briefly mention a few here, but I'm, I really want to talk about how you decide what goes on the loot table. So some loot tables just are a list of items. <clears throat> and it says, pick one to five of these at random. So when the thing, when it's ready to create the loot, it'll roll a random number from one to five. Let's say you pick three. And then it grabs three random things off the list, possibly allowing duplicates, possibly not. And that's what appears on the, the creature. Another way to do it is the list of items all have a probability next to it. And you just walk down and you roll the probability. 20% chance of this. Roll. Got it. 30% chance of this. Roll. Didn't get it. And you just walk down the list. And that's how some items are rarer than others and some aren't. You can combine those and say, I'll pick one to five things off the list of items that have probabilities. These are all great. They all have their own pros and cons. Really depends on what kind of game you're making. What I want to talk about, though, is how I decide what items end up on that loot table. No matter how you implement the loot table, how do you decide what ends up on the loot table? And this is something that I've done informally for years, but when I was at Carbine, I had a really good designer I worked with, Andy Curtin, and he talked about this method. And I've picked this up and I've refined it over the years, and this is what I've used in all my games going forward. So let me show you the loot table spreadsheet I use. So bing. You can see this is a spreadsheet of, it's a 2D spreadsheet. I'll talk in a minute about how you might have more dimensions than two. But this is a two-dimensional spreadsheet. The rows are player levels. I've picked here levels, uh, ranges of five. So one to five, six to 10, 11 to 15. What that means is for a player within that level, this is the sources of different loot types. Right, and I'll get to that. Now, I picked level range of five here. It's not arbitrary, but you can pick different numbers if you want. You can go down to smaller numbers. The risk is if you picked every player level, got a new row, then what's going to happen is the player is going to see basically new sources of items come in every time they level, and they're not really going to get a good feel for where the good items are coming from. So if you do it, if you if the range is too small, the sources vary too quickly. If you make the source the range too big, the sources change too slowly, and it means that the player, if the player is waiting for a good type of item and doesn't do crafting, for example, they may have to wait a long time for that item uh, before it changes to a new source. Let's go look at the columns. The columns are by loot type. The columns I picked here are, and this is, it's, it's very arbitrary, but it's, I picked armor by type. So there's helmets, chest armor, pants, gloves, and boots. And then just weapons and then consumables. There's a whole bunch of ways you could have done it. I could have reduced armor to just armor and then expanded weapons to 
melee and ranged weapons or magical and non-magical weapons or maybe the melee was broken down to one-handed melee two-handed melee and ranged in addition to consumables you might have crafting materials uh you might want to put junk on here i didn't because i'm like what is high quality junk it's junk but you might want to have hey when really expensive junk drops that's something i want to do as a as a, a potential loot source then the entry of each one of these, what's in the cell is a code, a two-letter code for the loot sources. And that you can see down on the bottom right. A loot source is what the, where in the world you would find that item. So SC means scene. It means it exists in the scene. You walk into a room, there it is sitting on the floor or sitting on a shelf. It's somewhere you can just walk right up, you see it, and you can grab it directly from the world, as opposed to a container. A container could be a dead body with something already on it. It could be a chest. It could be a bookcase. Um, I've seen games where bookcases are scenes, and I've seen games where bookcases are containers. You can do it either way. Containers are interesting because some containers can be locked. And that factors into what the player will need in terms of a skill and or items to get at that container. Then I have GD for generic drop. That's a drop off of just a unnamed generic monster. So like a wolf would be a generic drop as opposed to ND, which is a name drop, which is usually a named NPC. There might have, you might have like Greymane, King of the Wolves. He's a very specific character in the game. He gets an ND, a name drop. Another source of items are quests, QU, VE for vendors, CR for crafting. Now, just like what I mentioned with item types, you can expand these into different, you can make more of them if you want. For example, for quests, you might want to differentiate main quest from side quest. For vendors, you may want to have like village vendors versus city vendors. You may want specialized vendors like guild vendors, and you only want Item, the, the source of the best items to come from those guys at a particular level range. So let's throw all this together and I'll talk about what, what these cells mean. So we have player level and loot type intersecting at a cell. What that means is that loot type of item, that item type in the game for that player level range the best ones of those type drop in that from that loot source. Let's take a look at this levels one through five. So the best helmets for level one to five, say SC, that means the best helmets you find in the game are found in the scene. They may be in a dungeon lying on a floor. They may be in a room somewhere on the top of a, of a piece of furniture, and you can just grab it. Maybe it's guarded, maybe it's not. Chest armor comes from containers, so you find them in chests and um, in a safe, possibly locked, possibly not. The best pants in levels one through five come from generic drops, so you find those off of maybe a bandit. But the best gloves come from ND, which is name drops, so the best gloves at level one to five to find are from name drops. It might be the bandit leader. It might be the named guard in town. It might be the named necromancer at the bottom of the dungeon, but that's that's where the best gloves come from. The best boots, QU, quest. So the best boots they could find at this level would come from a quest. They'd have to finish a quest to get the best boots. The best weapons, VE, come from vendors. That means they sell them for that level range. Now you may question, what does that mean for that level range? Well, you can do it multiple ways. You can say maybe it's a vendor you don't expect the player to reach until they're this level range. You might say that the vendor has the item, but it's priced to be only available to a player of that level range. So at level one to five, it's very cheap. If a, v if a vendor was a source of a weapon at level 46 to 50, you might expect that weapon to be very, very expensive. So you don't expect a level one to be able to buy it. You can even go so far as say, that they don't sell it until you're that level range. Maybe you can see it in their inventory, but they're like, no, that's not for you. 
or maybe it doesn't appear in their inventory until the player's that range. There are pros and cons to doing it both ways. And then finally, the best consumables at level one to five, say crafting, CR. That means that the player will have to get the ingredients and make their own consumable to get the best one at this level range. Now, when I say best, that doesn't mean like, like, like let's talk about consumables. Maybe for healing, there are bandages that heal just a few hit points and they do it as a hot, a heal over time. So they take a while to do it. Those can drop anywhere. But a heal potion at level one to five, which heals you one to 10 hit points immediately, that can only be crafted. That's what this chart is saying, that the best at this level range come from these sources. The advantage of doing it this way is every row you want to mix it up so that from six to 10, you can see consumables, the best ones came from crafting, but level six to 10, the best ones come from scenes. The same way that vendors sold the best weapons from one to five at level one to five, but crafting makes the best weapons from six to 10. What's great about this is it means that if the players find a really good sword at a vendor when they first start, that sword is good and that sword will get them through many levels, but they'll start to see better swords later from quests, from name drops. So they're already always getting a source of better weapons. If they don't use one of these particular channels, for example, let's say you decide to play a game and you don't want to craft. Well, what that means is at level one to five, you're not going to get the best consumables. That means at level six to 10, you're not going to get the best weapon. That means at level 11 to 15, you're not going to get the best gloves. Now, will you survive? Yes. You can go a few levels without having the absolute best gloves in the game. But if you're the kind of player who wants the best every time, you're going to have to pick up crafting. And you'll also see the advantage of crafting. It, this kind of loot distribution highlights the advantage of doing quests, of killing bosses, of crafting. Because at some point in the game, they will be the best source of something that you want. Now, a couple caveats with this method. In this particular one, I set it up so that the number of item types and the loot type columns equaled the number of sources in the game. You don't have to do that. They can be slightly unequal, unequal. Well, what does that mean? If you have more loot types than you have sources, that means some sources will be repeated on every row, meaning for every any given player level, the best weapons may come from two different sources. Or... You just don't include a source on every row, which means maybe crafting isn't the best source of anything at a particular level range. If you have more um, uh, items, if you have more sources than you have items, did I get that backwards? If you have more sources than you have item types, you're going to have to duplicate some sources on a row or not use them. If you have more item types than you have sources, then you're gonna to have to have multiple sources per row to handle all the item types. And you're not gonna be able to avoid that. You're gonna have like, I don't have enough to, to, to go around. In general, keeping them equal is helpful. If they're slightly off by one or two, it's not that bad. It basically means the player will either go a level range where he sees multiple sources for an item type, or he goes a level range where a particular source isn't, doesn't generate an, uh, the best item type. Both of those are okay. But if the difference, if, if your loot types are drastically different than your, the number of loot types is drastically different than the number of so sources, that disparity starts to become really noticeable and they will, it, it matters less that you're trying to vary up the source because you either have a lot of duplicate sources or you won't see a particular source won't be the best for a long time. So I recommend trying to keep them close, equal or close to equal. There's another thing I mentioned where you don't have to make a two-dimensional chart. You could make extra axes. For example, a 3D chart would include, if you did classes in your game, would include classes. So it would be this chart, but when you go through it, it's like, well, the best armor for mages comes from this source, but the best armor from fighters comes from this other source. And that way, when you have a party of people playing it encourages you to go do different things so that everybody in the party can get their best items. 
you don't have to do that. You could collapse it and say all the sources are the same for all the classes. Or you could do what some games do. I know WoW did this, where when you... The source drops a token, and when you take the token to a vendor to spend it, you can only buy something that's good for your class. And that way you could say the best weapon comes from a name drop, but he really drops a token for a weapon so that it will always be good for your class. Good ways to do it. This is just how I did it. Now, the way this is used by, by your designers is let's say a designer comes up to you and goes, I just made a really cool bow for a player and I, it's about a good level 28 bow. Where should I put it? Well, you go to the chart and you say, well, weapons at level 28 use GD. So that means a generic drop, which means you will find these bows dropped maybe by, it's, it's on a bandit, just a generic bandit as a chance of dropping. That's where it comes from. If instead um, somebody has put in, say, a wolf and say, hey, I put in this level five wolf and I'm not sure what to put on it. Well, a level five wolf, a GD is pants. You can have the wolf drop anything. He can drop crafting materials, hides. He can drop teeth or whatever you want to drop. But occasionally, you'll find one that has pants. I'm sure he's not wearing them. He ate somebody wearing good pants. Um, hey, fantasy. So that's how this chart is used by designers making items. And it's how this chart is used by level designers who are putting in encounters and need to know, well, what do I populate the loot chart with? The... The, the, the great thing about this is item designers can look at it and go, hey, I am I really haven't made a, a lot of items for this level range of this item type. I need to put more in. Um, level designers may go, ooh, I don't really have a lot of loot tables at this level range that have this thing. I need to add more named creatures or I need to have more, um, uh, I need a quest in this level range because we... It's kind of stark here. There's, there's nothing dropping in this level range for quests. It's a good way of keeping your game balanced in lots of different ways and coordinating it through one chart that you share with the entire design team. Whew, that took longer than I thought. Anyway, that took almost as long as the, <laughs> the, game, economy video, the game economy video itself. That's how I do... That's my theory of loot table construction. I hope this helps. It's not the only way, but it's the way I find helps balance as many things as possible in one simple, easy to make and easy to read chart. Hope that helped.